So as I said, our story this morning continues where we left off last week. We know that uh, Paul is still in the city of Philippi, and he has been staying with Lydia, the woman that we met last week. Now remember Lydia, she is a non-Jewish God worshiper um, who is also wealthy and independent, in charge of her own household and business. We remember that Paul met her in the synagogue by the river just outside the city limits. And there she heard Paul's message about Jesus. And she immediately converted and was baptized. And she opened up her home to Christian community and ministry. Now, when we pick up our story uh, today, Paul and his group are again on their way to prayer. And while there's a lot going on in this service to grab our attention, we're going to look specifically at what it means to be set free. What does it mean to be set free by Jesus? Now, as we get into the story, the first part of it um, is rather perplexing, especially if we really look at it and don't just jump over it. And frankly, um, the details are rather troubling. So we meet a slave woman. A slave woman meets up with Paul and his group, and she begins to follow them. She has a spirit that enables her to tell the future, and she makes her owners a lot of money as a fortune teller. Now it's really important to point out that her spirit that she has is not a demon. It's not a demon. It's rather a spiritual power belonging to her pagan Greek religion. And it's also important to point out here that the uh, slave woman's circumstances stand in sharp contrast to those of Lydia. She is literally at the other end of the social economic spectrum. You see, Lydia is free. She is a woman who enjoys her own agency, and her wealth belongs to her and to her household. On the other hand, the fortune teller is a slave. She has no agency of her own, and what money she makes, makes her owners wealthy, not her. We see that Lydia has a name. The slave woman is nameless. So for several days, she follows Paul around, and she's shouting, always shouting, and her message is this. It's the same message she says over and over. These people are the servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation to you. And we have to uh, say and notice and admit that what she says is true. What she says is true. Ironically, as she shouts this message, she is accurately predicting what will soon happen with the jailer later in the passage. She predicts that a way of salvation will be proclaimed to him. But Paul finally can't take her shouting anymore. And he doesn't act out of compassion for her. But notice that he acts out of annoyance. He's annoyed with her. And Paul turns to the slave woman, but talks right past her, commanding the oracle spirit to leave her, which it does. In doing so, Paul demonstrates the power of Jesus Christ. He shows that the power of Jesus Christ is more mighty than any pagan god. And he also happens to show his own spiritual power and authority. And then what about the slave woman? Slave woman, poof, she disappears. Not to be seen from or heard from again. 
in the story. And so this is a bit of a troubling detail. Why didn't Paul set her free with the message of Christ? Why didn't he invite her into Christian community, which um, from the get-go was open to both free people and to slaves? We're left to wonder why Paul didn't do more for her. Well, the slave woman's owners are outraged at their sudden loss of income. They drag Paul and Silas into the marketplace before the city officials, and they are going to hear this civil case. But notice that their accusation isn't simply about financial loss. They are pointing fingers at Paul and Silas for being Jews who spread unlawful customs in the pagan city. And so the owners appeal to Roman anti-Semitism. And you know what? It works. The crowd's prejudices erupt into hostility. The court orders Paul and Silas to be stripped and beaten, and then they are thrown into prison, chained up, and heavily guarded. All through the coming darkness, as night settles in, Paul and Silas pray. They sing hymns, and they wait for God to act. And suddenly, around midnight, God does act. A violent earthquake shakes doors and chains free. As the prison foundations shudder, everyone knows that the Most High God of Paul and Silas is real, and he is right there, and this God is coming with the power to rescue them from bondage. So the jailer is terrified, and he decides in an instant to take his own life. He has failed to keep the prisoners secure. Also, he thinks that he must be spiritually condemned by this divine intervention, this divine intervention that has come about through this God of Paul and Silas. And so he is about to kill himself, but Paul shouts and says, hey, we're here. He alerts the jailer to their presence, and he stays the, ju- the jailer's sword just at the last minute. And so with fear and trembling, the jailer comes before Paul and Silas. He's, he's trembling, and he falls to his knees, and he asks, Honorable masters, what must I do to be rescued? What can he do? to be saved from his dire fate, both in regard to the earthly authorities who would punish him and the spiritual authority of this new God who has the power to judge him and probably would judge him unfavorably as a pagan prison jailer who's jailed up these prophetic men. Ultimately, the jailer wants to know how his life can be spared by Paul's God. Paul then succinctly but beautifully presents the way of salvation that the slave woman predicted. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. Paul tells the jailer to trust in the one true master, the one Lord Jesus Christ. And if he does this, if he can believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus, then he will be set free, and he will be set free in every way. As we saw in Lydia's case, the jailer shows the truth of his conversion through the freely offered gift of his hospitality. So the jailer takes uh, takes Paul and Silas and his group to his house. The jailer washes their wounds. And then the jailer and his whole household are washed in the waters of baptism. And then they all share in a joyful meal. 
The story wraps up with Paul and Silas back in jail come morning. The police, working on behalf of the city officials, tell, tells the, they tell the jailer to, you know, let the men go quietly, in secret. Paul refuses. He doesn't want to let those city officials off the hook for their unjust treatment. And so the magistrates have to come to the jail, apologize, and, and then they ask for Paul and Silas to leave Philippi. Before they go, though, they return to Lydia's home to encourage the growing Christian community there. So as we look closely at this multi-layered story, what does it show us about freedom? First, our being set free comes by believing in Christ. What this means is that we have new life in Christ and by the Spirit. We have that new life, and if we believe in it, if we trust in this new life, then we don't have to be shackled by anything or anyone. We are truly free. Christ sets us free to live out of our true selves as children of God who are free to love as God loves. We're free to love and live with compassion and courage, with hospitality and with joy. So if Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives, then we are set free to live good and generous lives. Secondly, we see that being set free in Jesus Christ means that we are not only free from whatever would bind us or burden us, but we are also set free for a particular purpose. And that's God's purpose of setting other people free. Conversion means to be set free so that we can help God set others free. So we see that Paul set the jailer free, not only by saving his life, but also by sharing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ with him and his whole household. We see that the jailer is set free from his fear, as well as from his sense of failure and the sense of self-judgment. We see that the jailer is free to now offer himself to Christian community and to service. But even as we see the jailer free, we have to acknowledge that Paul missed the opportunity to set free the slave woman. He missed the opportunity to set her free when he failed to share the good news of Christ with her. Even if he couldn't change her status as a slave, he certainly could have invited her into the emerging community at Lydia's house. Then the slave woman might have experienced for herself the way of salvation that she predicted for others. She would have been set free by the gospel truth which Paul wrote about in his letter to the Galatians when he says, you are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So part of our being set free through Christ is our capacity to recognize when we have missed those precious opportunities to set other people free, just like Paul missed it. The truth is we encounter all kinds of people who desperately need the freedom only Christ can give. And when we meet up with them, we sometimes can act with annoyance rather than with compassion toward them. We can be blind to their humanity, especially if they are in need. 
and we fail to see them as persons of dignity and sacred worth, people who yearn for their true selves to be set free. Sometimes our prejudices and our hasty judgments get the better of us, and we don't reach out to them in the same way that we reach out to those who are more like ourselves or those who we find more appealing. So when we've recognized, when we recognize we've missed the mark in sharing freedom in Christ with others, we need to use that very freedom to convert again, to turn again, to change our hearts and our minds and our ways. As we come to our Lord's table this morning, we come to be set free again by the new life that Christ offers to us. We come to this table remembering that there are many who long for this kind of freedom who aren't yet here. And we come to renew our calling to help others find the way of freedom and salvation that Christ offers to all. So with that hope and conviction, let us now gather about the table for our Holy Communion. <clears throat>